for courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit Philosophy Portal online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events. In January, we focus on the concept of libido and welcome guests Lehman Pascal, Alenka Zupancic, and Elliot Rosenstock. Find out more at philosophyportal.online. Welcome to another Philosophical Conversation. I'm Cadell Last, and I'm here today with two guests who have been on the channel several times. Uh, so in some sense, they don't need any big introduction, Lehman Pascal and Owen Cox, but I will give a little bit of background and context for this conversation. Um, I actually recently took uh, a course which Lehman Pascal was leading um, with Parallax, um, and uh, it's part of a larger sort of um, suite of courses, which is, is st I think, still available in back recordings on Parallax, um, which is a kind of emerging serious playground, um, which, which Lehman is, is constructing and co-constructing. And one of the central themes uh, of this serious playground is the concept of magic. Uh, and also, he recently just started a blog titled Zagic, and we'll get into what the heck Zagic is, uh, and, and there'll be links to the description um, uh, for both the courses uh, that Layman's been giving, as well as the the blog focused on Zagic. Um, and Owen Cox is just a, a longtime friend, obviously a creator of, of Techno Social Podcast. He writes at Dark Renaissance Radio, and I'll also leave links in the description to those. And, you know, in a lot of the conversations I have with Owen, we're talking about magic, we're talking about Aleister Crowley, and that really pops up in layman's work as well. So I thought that there would be a really good intersection here between these ideas. Why don't we just start off, Layman? What what, what have you been up to maybe with your general um, uh, tendency or motivation in, in the creation of the, these courses focused on on magic? And then we'll we'll take it from there. Yeah. First of all, I love that my phrase serious playground is getting used. That's good. Um, uh, a lot of people might know that I've been focused on a meta shamanics project, right? Trying to um, think about the relationship between development and the subconscious and the ecological and the archaic and the futuristic altogether. And for me, magic and the occult and the hermetic is sort of a subset of the general shamanic discussion. It's sort of like how the shamanic operates under the conditions of civilization, which has been a very fraught kind of relationship over the years. And I think we're at a point now in cultural history where the the informational and technological realities of the world around us are becoming so overtly magical in a way that it's really calling forward the necessity of this conversation again. But for me, that conversation has to or could take place in a way that's uh, both more aligned with the shamanic, uh, is better able to interface with the new wisdom conversations, which are sort of cognitive science, Buddhism, Christian mysticism, and things like that coming together to work out new ways of promulgating wisdom in the world. But those conversations uh, have marginalized the occult conversation in a lot of ways. Uh, and partly that's because the occult conversation often doesn't have great representatives, because its phraseology doesn't interface with the way they're thinking, and part of it's their own reactive sense of what might be going on in magical communities. But I think there's a, a whole continent of the wisdom discussion that's being left out as long as we don't go into the magical adequately enough. So there's a world historical necessity, there's a lot of interest, there's a clear role that it can play within the general emerging wisdom discussion, but in order for it to play that role, um, the sensibility and the conversation around it has to change a little bit. So I've been trying to help out with the Parallax courses, as well as participating in their new suite of magically oriented courses and set up this new blog and just hold conversations that try to initiate and see where this discourse around magic and wisdom and development can go. And a lot of that has to do with where uh, desire and where the subconscious uh, and where the... Mm, dark aesthetics and the challenge of uncomfortable feelings between reality systems and perspectives operates in all of this. And those are factors that usually get significantly underserved in the general wisdom discussion. 
Amazing. Oh, and did you want to want to jump in with with any thoughts? Maybe in particular, I'm thinking here about the relationship between the occult, the place of the occult, uh, in these larger conversations that Layman was pointing towards in regards to wisdom conversations, perhaps more oriented by uh, cognitive science, Christian mysticism, and and so forth. Oh, you're you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess what it makes me think is that. The occult, in a sense, this is nothing new. The, the occult, I mean, it literally means hidden. And in the history of the West, for a long time, I remember speaking to John Michael Greer, who's quite a prominent occultist now, and he used the phrase Inquisition barbecue. I think that's a quite a nice way of framing what would happen if you were outed as an occultist for a lot of the last cent uh, millennia, even. And so there's kind of been this parallel ecosystem of the occult with their practices and their ideas and the books that has been nowhere near the sort of the high cultural center, except in a few rare examples. And I think with modernity and the rise of the universities and modernity, modern science more or less takes up that same prejudice. It doesn't go on with burning witches anymore, but it kind of just goes, I mean, this is nonsense. You know, the, these people shouldn't be listened to. And then the occult community has kind of in the same way gone, well, these people haven't got a fucking clue. They're completely lost in abstractions and they have no idea about the symbolic world and the practical realities of the symbolic world. And they kind of just exist in totally different spheres. And then I see the modern wisdom conversation largely emerging out of the kind of the, the leading edge, you might say, of academic conversations, people in universities, people, cognitive scientists, um, and even people with journalistic backgrounds as well. So the two don't run into each other that much. And so I think I think the work that Layman is doing with this Zagic blog has been interesting precisely as a way to try and bring the two back together. But I think there's going to continue to be a lot of skepticism on both sides for a while. Yeah, I, I mean, think that's absolutely right. There are ways for these conversations. There are subsets within these domains that can come together and touch each other a little bit better. But there's a huge amount of deep resistance and mutual suspicion. And in part, that's because of different human temperaments. But in part, it's because a entire civilization's worth of history of really harsh persecution and marginalization has gone on and that's a difficult thing to get over but we can start to work on healing that for everyone's benefit my first my first point of sort of suspicion resistance <laughs> is it any <laughs> maybe maybe both it's it's not it's not really either it's it's sort of a what's coming to my mind is at first a paradox of what owen was saying um insofar as the occult means the hidden um specifically what's at stake in bringing that to the surface um showing it revealing it having a podcast about it <laughs> does it does it you know is is this a key navigation point you know like uh in terms of the occult being hidden you know what what's coming to my mind in in your what i enjoyed about your course layman was that when i was in your course i had fun I enjoyed myself, uh, but I didn't really know what was going on a lot of the time. Um, and 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 in, in in that sense, I was I was called sometimes to respond, called to say something, called to signify, in a space of relative disorientation, not knowing why I'm responding or if I'm responding in the right way, or you know, and and maybe responding in the right way is is a little bit me showing sort of a an academic sensitivity like i've got to give the right answer or something like that so that, that you know so i'm just just going to throw it back out there um when it comes to bringing the occult into larger wisdom conversations um podcasts or or discussions or retreats or whatever that's oriented more around science or religion or, or things that are revealed out in the open. Um, how, how do you approach that? Maybe, maybe specific, well, start with both of you, but maybe starting with you, Layman, how, how you approach that? Well, Owen mentioned that a cult means something like hidden, right? And there's a couple different ways and different motives for something to be hidden. There's the strategically hidden motivation, which is that you need to conceal and protect 
yourself and what you're doing from dangerous powers that might be around you. And sometimes that's because there's persecution and sometimes that's just sort of the etiquette of doing tantric and shamanic and magical things within the tribe. Not everyone needs to be exposed to it all the time, but there has been a real danger historically that we need to hide certain kinds of knowledge and especially certain kinds of practices. There's a self-hidden component, which is some of this stuff is very subtle, very nuanced, very complex, very experientially based. And it conceals itself merely because you have to be the right kind of person. You have to have undergone these things in order to even know what it's really about. But beyond those two, the part that really interests me and where one of the areas where Zagic wants to put its focus a little bit differently than some of the traditional discourses around magic is on the inherently hidden, right? On those patterns of sense making and on those opportunities for agency that exist outside of our, let's say, left brain in the Ian McGilchrist session, outside of our normal tactical representational ability to know about things and know what we're doing. We have a whole set of other capacities that involve um, being able to operate with what we don't know and what we don't understand. And it may be computationally that most of the patterns that are in existence are patterns that are not computationally reducible to the representational scheme of knowledge. They fall outside of the ordinary domain of the symbolic. So how do we get better at receiving and utilizing patterns that are real and that we exist in, but which can't be summarized as conventional knowledge? And that's something you then can't know, right? You're like, well, what are we doing in this course? It's a bit mysterious. It has to be a bit mysterious, right? We're specifically trying to get better at inhabiting and generating a skill set for dealing with things that show up as blank within our ordinary knowledge set. They are occulted even from ourselves, right? I made the the Hegel joke a few times within the course, you know, the mysteries of the ancient Egyptians were mysteries to the ancient Egyptians or, right, the mysteries of Gobekli Tepe were mysteries to the Gobekli Tepians. We're trying to deal with a domain of capacity that falls outside the domain of representational knowledge. And the first thing that involves is challenging that weird feeling you get of trying to inhabit spaces where you don't know what you're doing and what things are supposed to mean so that is a membrane of resistance to people that are really good at tactical left brain thinking but it's also something where that attitude can be flipped fairly easily if you engage a conversation where that's understood to be a good thing where you're supposed to have that feeling and that it leads to potencies I mean, uh, I definitely want you to jump in, Owen, but my my first sort of thought there is in regards to um, the occult there in terms of bringing it in, say, to the wisdom conversations uh, that you were mentioning. Um, is is it is it less of in the sense it's less about the representations that you're bringing to those conversations and, and more about the persona, the style, the way of engaging? Um or or am i am i am i miss am i missing something there in, just in terms of it being something that's outside the symbolic it's it's more a a way of a way of being a lot of it is right there's a notion of the difference between causal and a causal magic and whether you're trying to use magic as a sort of tactical machinery of hey, these people knew how to make these spells and now you're going to use this spell to cause this outcome. And there's a lot of interesting things to explore in that area. But there's a much deeper and broader field of magical interest where you are, I think, fundamentally building up your subconscious capacity to be an agent in the world of imaginal and nonlinear patterning. So you could say that's a different style, different comportment of being in the world. What's coming up for you here, Owen? Yeah, a few things. I think what Lehman said is brilliant. Um, I think with regards to this idea of the occult, first, there's the sense in which I just picked this up the other day, actually listening to another podcast with Greer, who I think if people are listening, I think he's kind of one of the best popular educators on magic these days. There's plenty of podcasts and he really explains things quite nicely. Um He's basically doing the branding thing that people used to refer to themselves as magicians a lot more, but magician has become a bit kind of tacky. And so at some point, I think he was saying 
around the 70s occult revival, people started to use the word occultist more as opposed to magician to kind of differentiate from this thing that's associated with magician card tricks and making balls disappear and things like this. However, there is then everything Lehman was saying about occult knowledge and there being things that might be dangerous or might just be that the way they have to be approached is in a different way. An example of this, I was um, I was thinking about the word mystery the other day, because this overlaps a lot with mystery, mystery traditions, and trying to dig up the etymology of the Greek word just keeps saying a secret right, a secret right, which isn't that helpful because the word secret is a Latin word, but everything just kept pointing to secret. But if you pull apart the Latin word secret, it mean it's from the prefix se and then cretere, which means to to sift or to kind of examine something, to to break it away. And so the secret etymology is together. It's something like to examine something apart for itself, to really examine something into the depths of what it is, as opposed to kind of just relating to it as part of, uh, say, a broad you might say a tradition. And so so we could take the crucifixion, right? Everybody knows this symbol of the crucifixion. It's everywhere. But to really make that an object of meditation, to spend five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour every day going, what the fuck is encoded in this thing, in these two axes meeting in a point and God sacrificed in the middle of it? You'll find if you actually dedicate yourself to that practice, a lot will start coming up, ideas, images, but they're not the sort of thing that if you kind of show up in a philosophy conversation, this is what this means, this is what this means, this is what it means, people go, okay, bro, fine, maybe it does mean that, maybe it doesn't mean that. And I think this gets into, there's a, there's a kind of style of interacting or communicating or being that isn't amenable to kind of rational uh, breaking it down and trying to establish truth, but rather it's a framing. It's what avenues of existence open up if you begin to live from a position where god is something that was sacrificed for example and to go back to the idea of the occult it's like this meaning there's that line i think in the bible about casting pearls before swine there's something about there are certain things that if you point them out to people and they're not ready to see them they just won't see them anyway and so there's a degree to which even it's partly operatively occult just because it doesn't make sense unless someone's ready to receive the transmission yeah that's a really good example that you just gave there you know i recently had a conversation with um <clears throat> uh, matthew seagal who's a, a philosopher or a theorist of um, whitehead and shelling among among other philosophers um and he was talking about um the importance of not only seeing is believing but believing is seeing that there's a loop between these these two functions and it, it, it kind of when you were talking about um you know specifically what existence opens up for you when you view for example god as as something that's being sacrificed on the cross is the type of believing is seeing you it only opens up for you once you believe it uh but this is in general i think the theopolitical space you know, in, in the theater. And, and this is, this is also something that's really difficult. I think, um, in philosophical terms, I think this is something really difficult post Kant precisely because we get critique, you know, like the critique of pure and, and it's hard to enter into a mode of believing is seeing, uh, after the critique. And so it's interesting to think about, you know, this, but, you know, actually, Slavoj Žižek has a famous joke that he repeats, which tries to get at this with Niels Bohr's horseshoe, you know, where the, the joke, if you probably both heard Niels Bohr horseshoe joke, but the, just for people who haven't heard it, I'll just say it. There was a, a guy who went to Niels Bohr's house, Niels Bohr, famous physicist, reductionist, breaking everything apart. Right. And the guy goes to his house and says, why do you have this horseshoe above your door? Uh, you're a scientist. You shouldn't believe in in these things, uh, these like. And Niels Bohr says, uh, I heard it. It works even if you don't believe in it, like it, it, that it believes for you in a sense, like it, it that there's that some sense giving himself to the a priori belief, you know, there. And 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 it's interesting to think about that as maybe a, a, a meeting point there. But in terms of specifically, I'm sure there's some viewers who are like, well, I first like the distinction um, you were making, Layman, um, 
between in your blog on Zagic between ma magic with a C, magic with a K, and then Zagic. And Owen, you're pointing out that many magicians stopped using that term magic and went to the occultist uh, symbol instead. Perhaps magic being too too corny or cheesy. Maybe, Layman, could you break down the distinctions between magic with a C, magic with a K, and then Zagic, and, and what you're trying to do there? Because I think some of the distinctions you're highlighting in, in your Zagic blog were really clarifying for me. Sure. Um, the first thing to note, of course, is that the uh, there's no real correct scheme of naming here, right? We're specifically talking about something that's... Uh, Praxis, uh, it's an experiential capacity that people train up to be participants in the world. And you always want to keep that free from bondage, from social naming conventions and category impositions. So uh, an uncertain circulation of different occasionally fragmenting terminology is a much better thing than to have everyone agree on the one name that we're going forward with. The sort of classic thing that I highlighted in the opening post of the Zagic blog is the move that Alistair Crowley makes in adding a K, right? So we have this notion of magic, which um, did kind of uh, multiple things anciently, it refers to a certain kind of performative craft, uh, people who present public wonder working tricks. Uh, refers to the possibilities of the use of elemental energies and the will to do things, and also refers to a kind of uh, naive, pre-rational inability to understand stable causal chains in the world. So it's doing all of that stuff. And Crowley comes along, and he wants to specify something that is uh, at least modern, uh, up-to-date, practical. He wants to give it a very general definition. And he adds this K, which has a symbolic, you know, definition. The K is a certain uh, number of the lettering of the alphabet, has certain significances. The 11 has certain significances. So there's a hidden meaning to that shift as well. But mostly what the public facing argument is, we want to say there's a real technology here. There's a psychotechnology to the generation of meaning and to our ability to harness uh, libido, intent, and coincidence to cause outcomes in the world. And we want to distinguish that from uh, all kinds of trickery and naivete and the sort of casual things that people call magic. Uh, and that's a powerful and important distinction to make. But I think there's a way now to look back on that and say, we want to find a space for that uh, performative element as well. I mean, a lot of the sort of postmodern and chaos magic kind of movements uh, fold the world of entertainment back in to the psychotechnologies. So we want to make a space for the sort of uh, mind states and engagements that are generated through even seemingly superficial forms of magic. But for me, bringing that X in, other than just to signify that I'm going to speak about it a little bit differently, is to fundamentally prioritize the notion of the particular unknown, which is what X represents in a lot of logical and mathematical functions. X marks the spot. X is the specified unknown variable in a computation of some kind. And what I wanted to really highlight is how these things work with subconscious and unknown processes, nonlinear functions, how it's not just a specific body of linear knowledge that you could gain access to. It's actually a skill set for dealing with nonlinear forms of understanding. And that these forms of understanding are non-dual in the sense of being particularized instances of the universal. There's, there's no fundamental distinction between the universal and the particular in magic. And Owen was pointing to you know, that esoteric ability for, you know, for those who have ears, let them hear. You can go into the symbols, you can go into the parables, and you can find something there that generates a potency in you and a meaning-making function that's specific to your engagement. It's not general. It's not pre-specified. It's not dogmatic. It depends on this specific instance. So it's not the surface level of the knowledge, but it's not simply abiding generically in the condition of non-conceptual mystery either. It's about starting to personally and participatorily work with a very specified instance of the mystery. 
You're not just dealing with, I'm in awe because there's mystery. You're doing, I'm working with this particular form of mystery, even though it remains mysterious, it's very specific in the engagement. So that's part of what X represents. There's other dimensions to it, but that's probably enough ramble. Any, um, anything coming up for you there, Owen? Yeah, I think on this um, this point of, say, unfolding the meaning, I was reading recently um, a paper, actually, about uh, biblical theology. And it said there were two different methods of doing it. There was the Greek method and the Hebrew method. And we don't have to get so into kind of whether it's correct to label one Greek, one as Hebrew. But the point was that basically they were saying there's a method which is kind of textually fundamentalist. And it comes that it, it literally cares what the word of the scripture is and says. And then the Hebrew uh, method is the one that is informed by the logic of the Kabbalah, where basically you've got these kind of 10 spheres with a whole shit ton of symbolism attached to each of them. And if you learn to think and read in that particular grammar, you can unfold meanings from texts that aren't necessarily on the surface. But if you're around other people who've learned to think in the same way, you can kind of literally play a game and unfold and unfold creatively there. And it's a different approach to, say, arguing over this is the literal meaning of the text. No, this is the literal meaning of the text. It's more of if we look at it this way, we can get this based on this sphere. And if we look at it this way, we can get this way based on this sphere. And then I was thinking about Freud and about psychoanalysis. Freud obviously being secular at the level of what he said, but raised Jewish. He comes up with a heuristics of interpretation for what's going on in the unconscious. He has a model, but in terms of the actual talking therapy, it's a dialectic, it's a conversation between two people. And one of, I think, the ethics of psychoanalysis that's been emphasized, if I'm getting it right in your course by Lacan, Cadell, is that it's not ultimately really up to the analyst to tell the analysand what the meaning of their own unconscious is, is to show them certain things and to allow them to make their own conclusions based on what is coming up. And that to me is actually very similar to what is going on, say, in an occult or a Kabbalistic magical way of working with symbolism, is that you look at it, you go into a kind of conversation with it and you see what comes out of it. And yes, then there's training and there's methods to test whether this is accurate or whether you're going into a kind of deluded psychosis, which is a risk. And that's why there are methods and why there are structures like the Kabbalic Tree of Life, which Alistair Crowley basically described as a filing cabinet for images. It's not a philosophical theory. And people make a mistake if they try to critique it from the perspective of philosophical theory. It's more a way of organizing your perception and your thoughts that at least historically has given rise to some pretty interesting stuff. And it is there in the Bible. It's like that the Lord's Prayer, thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. That is the Kabbalah. Those are three of the spheres, the power, the kingdom and the glory. And so it's all that it's like it's all in the roots of culture, whether you like it or not. And so to learn to see in this way and to interpret in this way, and I think that's the key to interpret in this way, is a kind of capacity that not everybody is um, is trained in. I think the irony being that children are actually often better at this than grown-ups. Yeah, it's great that's... to bring Freud in here. He's such an interesting intersection of uh, the the latent Kabbalistic patterning that's available in the Jewish tradition with his interest in hypnosis, trance, altered states, and his deep influence from Nietzsche, who I think has a lot to tell us about um, formatting the way we talk about these things going forward. One thing that came up for me is that famous, uh, you know, the known unknowns, all that kind of stuff. And there's a two dramatic polarities there, right? There's a notion of people who feel like they're confining themselves to the realm of the known, and they even fantasize when they think about magic that it's just an extension of the known, that somebody knows this stuff, and once I know it, then it will be known. And then there's other people who are very interested in the unknown per se, 
about sort of surrendering or abiding in the general condition of the unknown and the mystery. And mediating between these uh, are several sets of practices and discourses that involve the unknown knowns, right? And so magic and psychoanalysis and ideological critique all operate in this in-between zone where we're going to try to work with these things that are there as if we know them, but we don't know that we know them. And yet we still have to be able to interact with them usefully. Yeah, that's 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 a really nice intersection, and and the unknown knowns is a particularly fun category to think, um, <laughs> and or rather a category that thinks us in some sense, um, and and I I like sort of the way you're you're making that connection with the the analyst Owen, and and in connection to what 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 Layman was saying, um, I'm wondering if. The form of interpretation that emerges in in magic is is precisely a form of interpretation which assumes the lack of the big other, and maybe for that reason, um, is a skill set that that could could lend itself to like layman saying nonlinear forms of understanding because then and and also at the same time I, my 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 sort of um, I think maybe a concern that that some people would have would be. Um, what layman you were emphasizing as distinguishing what zagic is from a form of trickery because if 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 we are going into sort of a realm where we're we're teaching people to operate without the big other um it can also sort of be a space where someone could be manipulated uh someone could be perhaps um open to a vulnerable state of being and and in some sense uh, um potentially potentially taken advantage of uh, what are what are some of the the risks and some of the dangers here in terms of learning processes uh, maybe you've already experienced it in your course it's very interesting when we look at the risks and we think well some people are much more at risk from this stuff than others there are people whose particular set of neuro diversities uh, make them more of the shamanoid class, which is to say they have uh, inclinations and neural and psychological balances that make them reasonably interested in and resilient under the conditions of these sorts of practices. Uh, and they're not necessarily for everybody. Your access to them is usually modulated by other people who've done this before, by phased initiatory gradations, things like that, and also by learning to trust your own internal tempo and instinct in these areas. Um, there is a tremendous possibility for deception and manipulation, but that's not unique to this field. That's the uh, omnipervasive condition of the civilization in which we live, like right up from the ground level of our cognition and perception is lying to us in certain habituated ways. But into the extravagant modern society, I mean, a world where the primary forces of finance operate around marketing, which is what all the major digital platforms are running on. Marketing is, you might say, it's explicitly a form of black magic. It's a self-serving manipulation of people's minds in order to harvest something from them that's of use to someone else. So we exist within that world already. Our families are manipulating us. The news is manipulating us. Our exchanges, our chemical states, so the idea that um, you are specially at risk of delusion and manipulation and trickery in fields of magic is kind of backwards, because these are fields where you explicitly study the mechanisms of how that stuff operates and gain resilience and gain competence, gain the voluntary ability to go further into trances or not go into trances if you want, because you understand the mechanisms of how that operates and you've sort of... Um, developed gradually your own ability to go into those states and maintain your coherence and trust yourself in them. So without that kind of training, you are much more vulnerable to the general world of manipulation that we all inhabit and treat as normal. Now, not everybody's supposed to engage in this kind of stuff necessarily, but it's not more dangerous to go into these things. If you're at all interested in them, that it's actually a way to preserve yourself from a danger you're already inhabiting, but aren't feeling as dangerous. All right, that 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 makes sense, and and I, I you know I'm even I'm even thinking here about what you're saying, sort of about 
marketing as a form of black magic or you know we're always already manipulated and 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 so forth is is you know not only is is sort of um magic all around us but but these are these are forms of these are forms of hypnosis that are all around us already um now in ter- in terms of in terms of learning in terms of learning magic giving you sort of a a different perspective on these things <clears throat> i guess what i was trying to bring up as a, a potential red flag is i guess someone who uh is aware of these these techniques um sort of position positioning themselves as the master or positioning themselves as as someone who who knows in, in in sort of that space uh i'm not sure if this this problem has come up uh maybe in what you studied owen with with alistair crowley i mean are there are there are there sort of uh concerns with with cult like dynamics or maybe the the general question is what are the concerns here with with magic and cult like dynamics in some sense creating a a cult away from the cult of general society if that makes sense hmm. i mean in general i do think tend to think cults get a bad rap i think there were a hell of a lot of cults throughout history and if you ask people what cults do you know of they'll maybe be able to tell you of the charles manson cult. so people the pop culture remembers the cults that went wrong but the cults that didn't go wrong Nobody knows about them except the people who are in them. So there's also so just kind of foregrounding with a sense of, I think we perhaps go on the lookout. We we hear about these things and we think, how could it go wrong? And there's a lot of the time, maybe it's not as dangerous as it looks on the surface. However, I think, God, there's so much to say on this. There's something even in it actually about, to go back to what I was saying about the Inquisition barbecue, the way in which the Western tradition developed, as opposed to, say, Eastern traditions, is that because it was so dangerous, very often initiation was self-initiation. If you were injured, perhaps you happened to run into someone who was an initiate and you go, can you initiate me? And they kind of like pass you a scrap of papers and say, try this out. The idea of the kind of guru student relationship that we know and kind of think of when we think of, say, Buddhist or Hindu schools is I think has been less common. And I do think there is a bit of a a tendency even now, certainly in the Western occult to favor finding one's own path and being skeptical. And I think there's perhaps also a kind of an ethical imperative on people who are doing teaching or initiation to foster and encourage that in their students. I mean, perhaps that is even one of the the kind of like foundational ethical imperatives if one is putting oneself in a position of of the other in a sense to foster the meaningful differences in the students um i think perhaps from the perspective of the student oneself there's an element of these secrets one one can be shown the way but one kind of does have to walk through the door oneself and if you're already expecting to go to kind of what Lehman was saying, that there's just kind of no knowns and then you're going to know it and then you're going to be in the group of people who know it, that's not even approaching the problem in the right way. And if someone is approaching the problem in that way, they're probably not actually thinking in the right way to even go into these practices to begin with. Yeah, there's um, cults do get a bad name, right? But cult-like dynamics are problematic and cult-like dynamics, so to speak, occupy our politics, occupy our families, occupy our media, occupy all this kind of stuff. A, a cult itself is sort of the um, the basic unit of culture, right? The multi-dimensional network in which people try to bring forward some kind of um, meaning making that's potentially potent. And it's not more dangerous than the general range of cultic dynamics in the world. Nonetheless, I think there's a responsibility going forward to try to cultivate an ethos around quasi-occult practices that is more explicitly empowering, more explicitly oriented toward health, and contains a lot of the power dynamic critiques that have emerged over the last hundred years, as well as being informed by a sort of deep sense of care, compassion, and humility that should be emerging in a person as a result of ongoing inner practices. And I would say that um, magic is fortunate in some ways 
to have within itself a dialogue between light and dark magic or between the true will and not the true will, right? There's a very explicit discourse within occultism between different ways of doing this. And that's important because a lot of the other wisdom traditions don't have that explicit discourse. There's no conversation about um, good and evil first versions of Christian mysticism, for example. So magic is um, a place where you would expect there to be, and often there is, a more open discussion about doing this in a way that's self-expanding and mutually empowering as opposed to self-narrowing. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the relationship. You mentioned, uh, Cadell, the possibility that magic could be conceived as something that explicitly challenges the domain of the big other. And I think that's right. And that's one of the things that I want to highlight in the Zagic discussions. Um, but not everyone who engages in any of these practices is relatively free from that kind of power and ordering structure that's implicit in those particular dynamics that are critiqued in the big other discussion. So we have to set up this ethos that's well-informed, that's inwardly critical, that takes advantage of magic's traditional ability to distinguish between light and dark versions of the process, that's psychoanalytically informed, and also returns to the shamanic ethic that is upstream of the occult practices, which is the shaman is training to be of service to the village, right? We have a broken system right now where the, the shamanoids are not honored, especially by the village. They're not also training to be of service to the village. It's one system. The esoteric practitioners have to be training their capacities, not just for themselves, but to be of service in a collective intelligence system that they're a part of. As really well said, and I, I think that dynamic you're articulating between the shamanoid and the villagers is a is is an important one. Maybe we could go into that a little bit, um, in the sense of is that is that the right is that the right language when when we say villagers? What do we? What, I mean, shaman and villagers in, invokes perhaps um, a pre-modern cartography of human beings. Uh, is are there are the what are you trying to get at with that? Maybe first off, what are you trying to get at with that distinction and how should we conceive of it in sort of our modern, um, what, digital society? Yeah, we don't want to get too caught in the particular metaphors, especially when they involve some very explicit disjunction. I find it often better to think in terms of esoteric, mesoteric, and exoteric. You want it sort of at least three factors involved. But it seems like if you look back at human civilization, which is primarily archaic, most of it occurred before the last couple thousand years of writing. So as we look back and try to take the whole thing into account, most of our culture production, most of our wisdom cultivation, most of our meaning making processes occurred before the last 8000 years. So there's an important opportunity to return to um prehistorical metaphors, especially in the age of the global village, where the digital culture tends to resurrect some of those sensibilities. We just don't want to get too much trapped in it. But I would say that there are um, statistical ranges of genetically preserved neurodiversities, right? Just like there's a certain percentage of sociopaths. There's a certain percentage of transsexuals or homosexuals, right? There's certain sort of recurrent genetic and neurogenetic subsets of the population that play a role in the larger complex human social phenomenon that's evolving through time. And one of those subsets is a range of neurodiversity that inclines a person to be... Um, inclined toward and open toward ambiguity, threshold states, liminal experience, uh, non-human intelligences, modified use of the symbolic, uh, all these sorts of different phenomena. And there's like a huge list that we could go into there. But fundamentally, some people are born with an inclination and a capacity above and beyond the normal balances of these things to really get involved in certain kinds of um, practicing esoteric phenomena, and they can play a role in village life, and they were recognized and trained in certain ways to play a role in village life over the larger period of human history. 
And we've lost our general social tendency to recognize, train, and promote and secure those people. And we have to resurrect that in the global village if we want to restabilize our civilization according to the pattern that we've seen human civilization stabilize in in the past. And they also, these are specialists in accessing different ranges of sense making. And if we don't have people specializing in those ranges and have those people being listened to, then that information is not used by the collective to navigate. And it runs into some very obvious and predictable, you know, holes, crashes, crises. Seems to me like definitely in a neoliberal political economy, a lot of these um, shamanoids uh, might find totally different expressions than than in sort of a, a pre-modern political economy um but if the distributions are in if the distributions are the same then perhaps there's a, a way in which we could um rethink the community or rethink network dynamics uh, uh inclusive of these types um uh Owen do you do you have a, a similar way of of thinking about uh what layman's discussing or or bringing up here it it reminds me a lot of of bard's archetypology in some sense uh yeah i mean i i think you've kind of nailed it in terms of how i'm thinking about it as well um i suppose maybe one thing that's interesting to put onto the table is that my understanding is at least for the last few hundred years the esoteric or the occult movement has kind of skewed towards the political right seeing itself as an extension of the priesthood and the kind of the priesthood that weren't really allowed into the priesthood because they were doing stuff with fertility magic and with sex magic and questioning some of the fundamental assumptions say of the catholic church or of the anglican church or whatever but still there and then probably in the last 50 to 70 years or so the movement started to become associated with the political left and with this underground alternative culture that really started to bubble up in the 60s and in the music coming out of the 60s into the 70s, which is totally one thing. The occult energy happening there and the music happening there is all the same phenomenon as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the Beatles were the first people, the first kind of pop people to go and do their retreat in India that now every second teenager is going to do. And I think that's a kind of, it's a place to begin thinking from. I don't necessarily have the, the conclusion there, but it is interesting that it seems much more like the occult is largely represented as a kind of like um, growing folk religiosity, another term that Bard would probably use, while still having traces of its aristocratic um, character as well, which Golden Dawn, Thelema, Thelema, Alistair Crowley's organization came out of the Golden Dawn. These were quite elitist organizations. And I think even actually my reading today, there's a kind of tension and an under an explored tension within the occult community between its sort of elitist and right-leaning tendencies and its, its mass or its folk-leaning tendencies. Have you seen that as well, Layman? Are there political orientations here related to right and left that somehow uh, manifest in elite circles versus sort of more mass uh, orientation uh, might be relevant to what you were talking about in regards to the relationship between the shamanoids and the villagers? I think the occult has always been progressive because it always... Um is interested and in exploring and moving forward and trying to be at the sort of scintillating edge of the uh, libidinous diversification of experience. But the way we think about that from the surface discussions changes over time. And the new kind of socio-critical anti-hierarchical discussions that really burst onto the scene in the 60s can retroactively describe occultism from the previous few hundred years as being kind of right wing because it's associated with a lot of people who were coming out of privileged aristocratic backgrounds and making those same assumptions about how the magical schools need to be organized. Now, going forward, there's a huge opportunity to critique the way that magical schools and lineages are organized and see if we can break that open in a way that's 
healthier and more available to collective intelligence without succumbing to the obvious trap of self-neutralization through naive egalitarianism. But I think if we look back, um, and this is one of the arguments I want to make in wisdom discussion conversations that I have with people like John Verbeke who are looking for, you know, how do we instantiate the religion that's not a religion? Well, people have been trying this already, right? There have been intergenerational mixtures of science and spirituality that transcend nationality and culture and have initiatory procedures. Some of them have crashed and burned and some of them have succeeded. So there's a huge informational resource there. But when you examine it, the odds of being um, accepting uh, of Jews by non-Jews, the odds of including women, the odds of including homosexuals, um, the odds of including anarchists, right? All of those things are much higher within esoteric fraternities than they are in the general public uh, of those times and places. So it's very often been a place of protection uh, for people who are inherently progressive in a lot of ways. And one of the reasons is simply because those people are, they have something in common, which transcends the distinction that we normally make in social circles, right? If you are really good at magic, who cares if you're rich or poor? Who cares if you're male or female or anything like that? So they're very open because they have a uh, one particular value that overrides and outshines those other ones. Although also you could say one of the reasons they're inherently open and progressive is because they stand for full spectrum human experience and the way that the pre-civilized participatory transjective wisdom of humanity has been preserved under the conditions of civilization. So it's sort of working from a much more expansive, multi-dimensional, multi-energy basis, and it's privileging something that allows people to move beyond their normal social categorization. The only other thing I would say before I stop talking for a second is the social element, the social categorization system and what it represents is always ingressing against the magical. I'm, a lot of my thinking now is about the social recapture of the sacred and the way that the ideological forces within every society sort of actively attempt to um, not only periodically attack and barbecue, but also subvert and replace and marginalize sacred activities. Mm. I mean, a, a, a lot there. Um, I'm trying to hear zero in on on a thread that you were bringing up in terms of, you know, what does it matter what uh, class you're from or 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 race, gender? If you're if you're you said quote quote unquote good at magic, um, I just want to sort of zero in on on on, you know what I took from a, a recent course uh, on Nick Land through Theory Underground on sort of Alistair Crowley's definition of magic, um, and then maybe playing on that as a second step to get into what I took to be your distinction with Zagic. So let me just first emphasize Alistair Crowley's uh, definition as I, as I understood it was that magic is related to the will and that this is somehow related to what he calls the lima, or Thelema, and it's magical practices based on the realization of desire through will. So it's different practices that can use the will to bring uh, one's desire into actuality. So you're de dealing different practices in that way. Now, in terms of your article on Zagic, I know there was a distinction there that changed the relationship between magic and will uh, specifically, but maybe could we first go into what Crowley's trying to get at there and and maybe some of the touch points or entry points that people that could help people understand what's going on there. Crowley's definitions are uh, beautiful in, and important in certain ways, right? One is that he brings libido back to the center of the process. And another is that he tries to expand the notion of magic uh, in a transdisciplinary sense, right? When he says, the art and science of causing change to occur in conformity with will. Um, that's a way of talking about it that opens up a wonderful, vast uh, field of insight gathering. If you can understand that writing a letter with a pen has something in common with the sorts of rituals or altered states that you want to go into, um, then your ability to see the mechanism that's involved generically goes way up. Um, 
So I, for myself, I find Crowley's attempt is too broad. It doesn't zero in on the thing that draws people toward the magical styles of doing this, but it has the virtue of being much broader than traditional definitions. And of, like I say, uh, laying bare common dynamics that are found in everyday phenomenon, but not perceived to be magical, although perhaps they should be. I mean, I, I want to get you to um, come in on this, Owen, as well, because I know you're you you've studied you've studied Crowley. I, I like I like sort of the emphasis there that I know we've talked about this as well, Owen. That that Crowley's bringing libido to the center of the process, um, also sort of giving me this sense that no matter what no matter what field you're in, uh, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a theologian, whether you're um, in business, whether you're whatever field you're in that there there's something magical about realizing your something magical about bringing your desire into sort of conformity with the will or some relationship to the will and um maybe get your thoughts here Owen, on 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 what how you've uh, made sense of this yeah again massive massive topic I mean, it's interesting just the other day in preparation for this i was leafing through crowley's book of the law which, according to him, was a transmission he received from uh, a, an external entity called Ivas. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, which essentially laid down the law and the underpinning principles for magical practice for the new era. So that's something that can be debated, but he, he received this while he was quite young. Uh, he says he locked it up in a cabinet for a few years, didn't want to have anything to do with it. And then started to come back to it and kind of investigating into what the fuck is this thing that's written itself through me, I suppose he'd probably say. And uh, it's interesting reading his notes about the period prior to writing this. He says, I was reading a bunch of Kant, I was reading Hegel, and I was reading, I think, David Hume and a few of the other big philosophers of the 18th and 19th centuries. So I, that kind of blew my mind a little. It was something that I'd suspected but it was nice to see that laid down, that actually precisely the sorts of philosophical conversations that uh, we have been having and that have been explored in 20th century philosophy, I think that you do very well at talking through, Cadell, the same sorts of ideas were going through Crowley's head. And certainly in the first chapter of the Book of the Law, of course, you kind of have to decode it because it's written in a very symbolic language. But one of the things he's saying is that this Egyptian goddess Nuit, who is basically the representative of empty space, that's kind of the primordial deity. Which is very different, say, to a Judeo-Christian ethic that the father is the primordial thing we have to reckon with. That there's actually this emptiness, this nothingness behind manifestation, which is the thing that we really need to look at and be in relationship with. And then he's got this other bizarre statement that I can never remember which way round it goes, but it's either the coup is in the carbs, not the carbs is in the coup, or inverted. But basically what it translates to is that the star is individual is in the individual soul, not the individual soul is in the star. And thinking through that, I always think that's a really interesting theological flip. Rather than saying that, say, the soul of a man or a woman is a fragment of the divine soul, the divine soul, one divine soul. Rather, this divine soul is in the singularity of every individual man and woman, which again sounds very Hegelian, as far as I'm understanding. It's moving from the abstract universal into the particular and the singular universal. And so I think the way I read it is that Crowley is also reacting to the great tradition of philosophy that came up in the latter half of the last millennium and trying to encode that into occult practice in a way that I think the other occultists, to be fair to them, were also actually intuiting and working with, but I think he formalized it. He is such a fascinating and uh, simultaneously inspiring and troubling figure. And obviously, it's hard to fully engage with his statements about what's happened to him because he's a trickster and a self-mythologizer and uh, 
of seemingly a espionage agent of various kinds. But I find a lot of value in his recounting of these stories. And I place a lot of trust in that document in particular. I think the Book of the Law, Libra Velagis, will end up describing a lot of the way that these practices unfold for the future, even if he was to be forgotten. And I take him at his word that he only partially understands the significance of this document. So the, the source document of Thelema, one of the interesting features of it, from my point of view, is it's very perspectivalist, right? It's like an attempt to, uh, it somehow mediates between Nietzsche and Ken Wilber, right? It creates a perspective-based religion where you are Hadid. You start as this point of perspective taking. And you are on a trajectory to merge with Nuit as the, you know, total potential of all the perspectives. But because you start from your own ultra individual point, the way that you get there will always be distinct to you. There'll be a particular signature to the way you go through that. And that individuality has to be honored. And then the way that you make moves through that is by constantly engaging with and fusing with new kinds of perspectives and realities that might even initially strike you as unpleasant, abhorrent, or foolish. So you're merging with, you're undertaking these acts of love where opposites are ultimately fused through a mutual engagement, mutual understanding to liberate you to your next phase of perspectival growth. Uh, it's a beautiful, it's a fantastic vision. And yes, the will is in there and it's central to that. Now, the will has been central to all kinds of magic for all kinds of epochs. So one has to be a little bit careful in distinguishing what uh, Crowley or this revelatory document are trying to say about it. But they're suggesting that the formula for the use of the will, and we could expand that and say the use of um, intentional participation in symbolic, imaginal, and somatic flow patterns uh, to generate effects in tandem with reading and writing into coincidence or something like that. That's a messy way to say it. But this phenomenon can be done in many different kinds of ways. Different approaches to it can be privileged. So there's a notion that there was something like a, uh, a primitive matriarchal tribal period in which certain kinds of approaches to doing this were privileged. And then the uh, age of Osiris, right? The age in which um, blood ritual and sacrifice and conformity and hierarchy and martyrdom and chastity and asceticism were sort of the characteristic features of developing one's capacity to do this, that we are moving out of that into something that Crowley saw beginning in the modern age and growing beyond it, which is that uh, play and pleasure and liminal states and individual growth will be the epicenter of the development of intentional participatory capacity in reality and also the fundamental interpretive framework through which we understand the non-dual background of reality that was a really powerful reflection there on the relationship between um crowley as a type of perspective-based religion and and sort of the you know the way you were talking about the engaging and fusing of new realities there i i feel like it it captures a lot of what's going on on the liminal web whether that's intentional or will based or not and whether people are just sort of accidentally stumbling into these things or whether they're sort of taking it upon themselves to let's say uh willfully confront this path um I wonder, I would like to stay a little bit more on the topic of will to sort of clarify that a little bit. I know that Crowley has that that axiom, do what thou wilt. Um, I know Owen and I, you and I have talked about that a little bit. Do you have a a perspective on that, Layman, uh, in, in terms of its relationship to your project? Uh, yeah, the recent Zajic article was focused very much on the will and on several aspects of it that I feel like are underprivileged in discussion. Um, whether we think um, from the point of view of psychology or the point of view of ontology that there's some special specific structure that we call the will as sort of irrelevant in practice we can do something like intending and that intending comes out of uh, libidinous polarized energies that are already in our being so my perspective is sort of threefold there are 
things you can do to cause things to seem to you to go in accordance with your will. There are things you can do to build up your capacity to be an intentional participant, to make your will stronger. And that's a conscious and a subconscious procedure because most of our willing is unknown to us. Uh, and then there's this notion which comes to Crowley's dictum around the true will and around do what thou wilt, because everyone involved with Thalema will tell you that that doesn't just mean do whatever you want. It's it's very specific. It's the attempt to do what the universe wants through you or do that thing whereby the accomplishment of it represents your unique instantiated um, participation in non-duality. Right, where the sort of the the non-dual background of the universe is uniquely well articulated in your case through a particular gesture or move, uh, which typically has something like a flavor signature. Right, it's it was just so you to do it that way, and that you have in a way no choice but to count on that as the action that maximizes your ability to contribute positively to change at multiple scales. So we're, you know, what's the playground in which the will is operating? Do you want to eat this chocolate bar now and satisfy that will? Or do you want to take into account the will that looks back a year from now and says, oh, I didn't want to eat that chocolate bar. I had decided at the beginning of the year that I was going to eat fewer chocolate bars, right? So the will operates on different time scales and it operates on different spatial and relational scales. Right. You have a will that might encompass your loved ones, might encompass the biosphere, things like that. But you can't calculate. Right. You can't go to your the foyer of your left brain and figure out which things are going to maximize your productive pleasure and agency across multiple ranges of identity and multiple scales of time. How are you going to figure out which thing to will that's in alignment with the greatest number of those frames of potential meaning making? So one thing is you can engage in a kind of um, imaginal archaeological investigation to try to figure out if you can uh, characterize for yourself the nature of the mission that you're here to perform, right? And magic is full of various rituals around that, trying to learn the nature of your true will, the identity of your holy guardian angel, trying to get through various kinds of experiences and dialogues and self-reflections knowledge that you could implement about what kind of person you are and you could broaden that out and say you make a study of like when did i do things that were very me and they also succeeded versus other strategies of action where i thought it was a pretty good idea and it turned out to have terrible effects for myself and the people around me so you can make a kind of analytical study of the way you could be operating optimally in the world but even that, it's going to have serious limitations on it because it's coming at it from the point of view of uh, the person who can know things about themselves and the world. So then how do you, outside of that, potentially optimize your ability to take constructive agentic action um, toward um, pleasure and enjoyment across multiple domains? There's some kind of feeling quality, some kind of vibe, that's essential to the way you do your best work in the world. And there needs to be, I think, a much richer set of magical orientations around this. Magic already has some things like this, but we need to go much further in helping people develop the skill sets of figuring out how to have a stronger will and figuring out what to will and figuring out which sort of immediate, instinctive, and intuitive indicators in themselves suggest to them that they are on course to be sort of willing and fulfilling the particular kinds of action in the world that best serve them across these multiple scales and best instantiate the non-dual background. And the, the first thing that's coming to me there is is just that I feel like probably a lot of people would benefit from maybe a course, maybe in your writings, you'll you'll come across this is is just the the real emphasis on the scale of will, like the example you were giving with the chocolate bar and the immediacy versus the chocolate bar over the entire year, uh, and 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 what you're just emphasizing there in terms of stronger will and what to will. Um, Owen, is there any any thoughts there that's coming up to you in regards to Crowley's "Do what thou wilt"? And I know you also always emphasize uh, 
Crowley's emphasis on on that being nested in relationship to love? Yeah, I mean, so there's the do what thou wilt is famous, but actually it's just the first half of of the teaching, which is do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. And I actually think that second bit is super, super important. It's actually what catches the, you might say, naive libertarian reading out, which is, oh, great, I just get to do whatever the fuck I want. It's like, well, what what about love? And of course, we have to do a bit of expansion on the concept of love. But if we take it to mean something like meaningful and reciprocal, respectful and mutually enriching relationships between people, which also are mindful of real differences in capacity and power, then all of a sudden, it doesn't mean anything like just follow any whim you have. It's more, there is something moving through you. And you do have, you do need to be in relationship with it. But you also need to be, I suppose you might say philosophically, mediating that in relation to the wills of others. But that is what love will manifest as. And as a critique of uh, former ethical systems, you might say, where there was a sense of love and between, say, people in a community, but the truth of the will was suppressed relative to a kind of surface level agreement on what was supposed to be done. And this is precisely what leads in, you might say, traditional religious communities to the ostracism of anybody who doesn't conform to whatever the norm of what love is supposed to look like. And so there is a very, very radical message in in this. Um, I think the other thing that I want to to mention, and this goes back to a conversation that Cadell, you and I have had several times recently, um, is about when people receive certain initiations or certain pieces of knowledge. And, um, you know, we this topic came up between us because we were talking about an experience with a mutual friend who is a, a clinical psychologist and talking about the issue that they're having these days with you get kids showing up to train to be clinical psychologists, 23 years old, who've basically had an undergraduate course in postmodern philosophy. And they've been trained to deconstruct everything they're taught, but not actually how to put anything into practice. And she's saying, this is a real issue when you've got 23 year olds who you're trying to tr- to train to be working with incredibly vulnerable, say 12 and 13 year olds. And all they can do is point out how the training that you're teaching them is privileged to say a white male perspective. You're not actually producing people who can do the meaningful work in the community. And so like, there's so much that's been cut off beneath the surface because the education system is giving them a perspective that if you can hold the rest, say, of the tradition of philosophy and then see what, say, the, the insights of a Deleuze are or a Foucault are, then you can do interesting things. But if you only know Deleuze or Foucault and only know it through a kind of simplified undergraduate reading of it, it's dangerous, to put it quite. So if it, it, it's A, it's impractical and B, it's dangerous. And I've begin, begun to find similar things with Crowley, actually, just in terms of my own experiments. I think Crowley is a brilliant prophet, but I don't think he's the best teacher. And more recently, I've started to pick up works, uh, Dion Fortune, who was more or less one of the contemporaries of Crowley. I find her teachings of actually occultism, of magic, of the practice of how to understand the Kabbalah, much more accessible and much more tempered, you might say much more conducive to learning how it works whereas Crowley gives you everything and then says deal with it at least that's the way the books are now in fairness to Crowley as well I don't think any of these people predicted the internet I don't think any of them predicted that less than a hundred years after they were writing you'd be able to find any of these texts whenever you wanted it and that there'd be a mass industry around it, that these ideas would blow up in something like the 60s. I mean, Crowley, I think in the postscript to the the book of the law says, if you've read this, burn it. Like these are supposed to be secret texts for people who have been, who actually been initiated in a mystery school that recognizes they're ready for the knowledge. What we're grappling with is that (laughs) those mystery school structures are not there. And so people are just wandering out into the forest and um, 
that's where I think something like do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law can very quickly and very readily be misinterpreted. As I think actually some of the ethics of the subcultural communities in the latter half of the 20th century, I think did draw a lot of inspiration from Crowley with some pretty detrimental effects. What they've ended up producing is kind of subterranean underclass populations with massive problems with drug and alcohol use because they go into these ecstatic rituals trying to do their will the whole time and trying to be away from society but they haven't actually found the way to mediate it into having a kind of a position ultimately of power and authority and respect within the society itself yeah there's a lot of uh well there's an interesting taxonomy of um social psychological trends that get in the way of this kind of stuff like there's the naive romantics who are a little bit solipsistic the kind of people who think that magic means you can just um vision board your way to whatever world you want because quantum mechanics or something like that uh there's this emergent especially in the last 50 years anti-will sensibility that considers intent itself to be something like uh, a malicious part of the patriarchal dominator aesthetics. That has to be really challenged because we need to be building up the force of intent for a world in which our attention is going to be increasingly captured and manipulated by automated factors. But there's also this naive libertarian position that Crowley himself frequently got trapped in. And it's a pernicious combination of that attitude of uh, enforced liberty with a lot of individual trauma and pathology that people are living through, where they're uh, emotionally and sexually and physically abused, as Crowley was, as most people were in that civilization, and they don't have a lot of rich training about how to be a heartful human being in the world. So we need to be looking at do what thou will should be the whole of the law and love is the law of love and her will. Some kind of conjunction between the increase of our ability to be intentional participants in the structure of reality and some kind of increased alignment between that intentional capacity and our ability to be vulnerable, caring, open-hearted uh, spiritual participants in reality. And at the middle of that is figuring out which kinds of actions are going to serve both of those. And that gets us closer to that true will discussion. And the problem that Crowley had as a teacher, and as Owen was saying, a lot of his successors, both in the uh, private world of occult fraternities and in the general cultural movements of the mid 20th century, thought that if you just have sex with whoever you want and follow any kind of drive that comes up and nominally tell other people that they can do the same thing, that you're somehow following the will and spreading love. It just leads so immediately to catastrophes that that can't possibly be the way. You've got to really train and deepen the heart and alignment it with the capacity for will. I mean, this distinction here that's coming up for me is like, the danger of the will when it's not situated properly within um, a larger conception of desire and love. And, and you know, y you can will something, but do you desire it? And do you understand sort of like the, the larger telos of your, of your life and, and specifically perhaps related to, to love and, and, and not only to be loved, but also the capacity to love. Um, and I, I think that that brings it, brings it well to sort of, I think the distinction you were trying to make with, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the distinction you were trying to make with magic with a K uh, and Zagic is, a, and and I interpreted in your paper as something that sort of, um, maybe it includes the will, but it's kind of not about the will, is the the emphasis that I, I wrote down here is that Zagic is a performative, intersubjective invocation of wonder, organic innocence, joy, and mystery. So it's sort of less um, about, let's say, willing, willing what you, willing what you want, and more about sort of, um, a again, a, a certain a certain state of a certain state of being, cultivating a certain state of being. Um, am I off here? What's 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 your what were you trying to go I mean, at? With there's you? there's a complex set of interrelations there, right? The the conventional notion of magic as a set of practices that you might do in order to try to cause a particular effect that you are aware of to come to pass in the world, 
that can fit within that notion of Zagic. It's just that it's not limited to that. However, in order to do any of these things, your ability to be an intentional being has to be increased and refined, right? Every kind of psychotechnology and inner practice involves some kind of intentional attention of some kind. So your ability to be a participant in Zagic, your ability to be a participant in the creation of meaningful patterns of reality that serve you and serve the things you love, that's all fundamentally based around the development of your capacity to be an integrated intentional being. However, most of the way you do that involves negotiating with the unseen plurality and subconscious nature of human intelligence and agency, right? It's not coming out of your um, superficial, self-reflective, left brain, pleasure-seeking identity. It's coming out of your the whole manifold of the background, plural, interactive possibilities of subconscious intelligence and the kinds of pleasures and identities that that one is capable of moving with. So play, for example, and mutuality, these are uh, strategic ways that we're capable of training up our own subconscious intelligence and the subconscious intelligence of others, right? So there's a lot of things. If we expand what we mean by love, if we expand what we mean by will, then it starts to have this other flavor. But we want, I want anyway, with Zagic to specify that that's what we're talking about. And we're not talking about the the kind of degenerative collapse into willing from the narrow false self-identity into a prescribed tactical effect on the world. Little bits of that are valuable, but fundamentally that leads to a kind of self-narrowing of experience that ends up precluding uh, the magical encounter with an enchanted reality that's satisfying to yourself and others. Oh, and does that, does that make sense to you? Where, where is it, where is it falling with you? I just had to reply to a message very quickly, so I missed that last little bit. So maybe, Cadell, you go, and then I'll jump in in a sec. Well, just it seems like um, a lot of what what you're trying to to emphasize there is this this distinction that you keep on referencing with the left and the right brain. That if we're if we're willing from a certain very narrow short term perspective, or if we're willing from a very superficial perspective, maybe a disembodied perspective, then we're kind of we're 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 using the tool of magic in the wrong way that that it has to include sort of the more full body and and a more playful orientation in general yeah that sounds pretty spot on i think and i think this is where the cross-pollination with the discourses coming out of say psychoanalysis and also the work being done say in the tantra schools at the moment is super interesting Hmm. I mean, is is that connection of relevance to bring up? Uh, have you have you had any sort of connections with with the tantric schools and orientations? Do you feel like anything that's going on there is is playing in the same playground as you're you're pointing towards, Layman? Oh, absolutely. If we're looking at this uh, question of the possibility of integrating the uh, magical and let's say, conventional approaches to wisdom going forward for a global civilization, right? We're looking at taking certain aspects of each of those conversations. There are certain kinds of um, Buddhist mysticism. There are certain kinds of cognitive science. John Verveke is doing a very good job of uh, setting some new linguistic tools in play where we can say, oh, imaginally augmented participatory transjective encounters with the sacred. But that really opens you up to be describing magical procedures in a lot of ways. So from their side, from that side, there's certain kinds of conversations that are available. And from the occult side, there's certain kinds of conversations that are available to that conjunction. And those conversations are, I think, psychoanalytically and tantrically informed when they're at their best. Right. The um, occult penchant for looking at art and the subconscious and the dark and sometimes transgressive aesthetics of self-development and character development and cultural transformation, that really needs to be informed and organized by powerful psychoanalytic models coming out of our best psychoanalytic thinkers. It also has to be informed by powerful tantric thinkers 
right? The tantric thinkers are attractive to the magical community because they speak to pleasure. They speak to libido. They speak to imaginal deities. They speak to transformation. But they also bring in fundamental non-dual state experiences, fundamental human maturation, fundamental elements of that Buddhist compassionate sensibility. So when you have those things together, when you have the um, the alchemy of a transjective cognitive science informed by Buddhist and Greco-Roman and Judaic mysticism coming together with an occult lineage informed by leading edge art, informed by psychoanalysis, informed by ideological critique, and informed by Buddhism in its own way through the tantric modalities, then you have the possibility for a really rich magical discussion and practice set to start emerging right now at this moment of history where we so much need to be empowered in this way because we're facing a world that demands to be described magically. I mean, what are the what are the big hurdles do you think or or what are the major um sort of um stumbling blocks that are in place to to bring together these these different orientations the psychoanalytic the tantric um the the um the 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 zagic angle in terms of uh i mean how how do you imagine that coming together or or have you sort of thought about this at all it's hard to say how something grows in that space. The very first thing we can do is what we're doing right now is that we can call out for it. We can say, here's a space and this thing can grow in this space. Uh, people who are interested in magical practices can try to inform their description of those practices in a way that might be more acceptable to the discourse that's arising in these other areas. And I think in particularly the, the fertile potential crossover that I still haven't seen a lot of between leading edge cognitive science and sort of radical psychoanalytics in terms of, say, Lacanian models and things like that. Uh, that's a really fertile zone where the terminology used to describe those patterns can also be used to describe the things that people are doing in the magical arts and create a kind of... Uh, transmission chain of communication between these two domains but fundamentally it takes people who see the opportunity call for this kind of thing to happen are willing to have discussions with a lot of people all over this discussion space and experimentally attempt to language it in different kinds of ways and use different sets of framings around the values and practices I mean, it, from for again from the the course I just took on land, it it sounds like what you're pointing towards is is what land would call a form of hyperstition, um, a type of casting a, a type of casting a spell, you know, just uh, speaking into existence and and hoping it will will come into existence or like to accelerate a certain future. In this case, the relationship, let's say, between cognitive science and psychoanalysis, some. Uh, some examples that 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 came up in the the course on land were uh, this idea that 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 Dave and uh, and Mikey of Theory Underground uh, meme the Peterson and Zizek debate into existence just by memeing about it and sort of calling it into existence in this way. Or uh, they were saying that you know even someone like Donald Trump was memed into existence. Um, they gave a whole bunch of other examples, but. Um, does this resonate in terms of what you're what you're thinking in terms of just by sort of put it putting it out there, sort of just speaking about it that certain that there's in some sense we're we're casting materialist spells on the world? Yeah, the hyperstition approach is a really powerful one. And that's one of the reasons people are excited about talking in those terms lately. Um, because uh, not only is there a real and magical dynamic in sort of speaking something into the world, which is something we're doing right now, we're creating the discourse that we're talking about, and it can continue to have effects going forward. But it fundamentally, and I think this is an under inspected area of magical study, it locates us in the position in which we actually have leverage, right? For most things going on in the world, you can check your will, you can check your intention, you can check your language, you can have discussions, right? This is actually where you're located. You're located in the mm, exchange between 
libido, mind, memes, and discussions. Uh, most of us are in this position on most topics, right? I can go out and operate my automobile. I have direct physical control over that. I don't have direct physical control over cultural movements. And most people are, and this gets to the question of the will, highly involved in areas in which they have no leverage, in which their intent can do nothing, right? It's not that we shouldn't know about or care about Israel versus Hamas, but 99% of all the people who are engaged on that topic could literally do nothing about it, even if they had the exact correct point of view on the subject. So one of the things we have to do when thinking about the will is um, zero in on where you actually have levers to begin to instantiate effects in the world. And hyperstition is a great way of thinking about one of the levers that most of us have some immediate access to. And of course, there's this is one of the things I love about Land's work is this love the Lovecraftian notion, right? That there are uh, dangerous uh, layers of hyperstitions folding themselves into society, and that the the social layer itself is permeated by these um, uh, self moving and potentially very destructive and deranging hyperstitional elements, and we are either sort of passive. In the face of these things, the way we're passive in the, in the established egregores, or we become participants in the production of hyperstition and egregoric elements that might go in a direction that would be more satisfying to ourselves and to the flourishing of human nature in general. Yeah, I mean, I'm really resonating strongly with what you're saying about um, locating yourself where you can have effects on the world. I mean, I'm just like, um, I mean, and the example of sort of casting some sort of hyperstitious spell on cognitive science and psychoanalysis might be precisely a location where that could happen. Um, certainly the conditions of possibility are there. On the other hand, when it comes to things like Israel, Palestine, maybe less so, who 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 knows? I mean, I do often see people who take very strong political opinions online as sort of not recognizing the place of their impotence or or not coming to terms with where that where they're impotent um it's hard to know the line on these things uh oh and is this is this something you've experienced as well or something you've struggled with you're you're on a mute there i've done it again yeah i mean so to to rewind slightly because this is something i've been speculating about a lot recently one of the things that occultists talk about is the astral plane, where exist all of the the subconscious and semi-conscious images, you might say, that we experience in our minds. And um, what has happened with electronic media and now the internet is that this astral plane that occultists have always said existed, but you can kind of just think of, of this imagistic semi-consciousness is now out there and everybody can see it and everybody can tap into it. It's there on the internet. And I mean, literally kind of in a material way, the electromagnetism around our planet is now constantly reverberating with all of these images, whether it's cat videos or whether it's pornography or it's everything and anything that's on Instagram and on the internet. So all of a sudden we're kind of spending a lot of time in what is called the astral plane relative to the past. And yet everything needs to be brought down to what's the physical plane in order to have kind of like tangible effects in the world. And actually to kind of disappoint people who want to go fast, a lot of the occult teachings, surprise, surprise, will say first and foremost, get a real holding in the physical world before you start to play with these higher intelligences and higher entities. Of course, what tends to happen is that precisely the people who are drawn to these things are the people who are sensitive to the more the more intangible planes and less grounded in the material reality. And that's where a lot of the pathologies in the occult world seem to come from. But I do think to go back to the point that you guys were just making, it's increasingly actually a principle just of good mental hygiene to be regularly saying, okay, what is happening that's purely in this realm of vibrating electromagnetic images and what is actually the material body that I have and the material space where I can interact? And do I have practices, rites, 
uh, relationships that bring me down to this sphere and, and allow me to engage and actually bring whatever's going on in this abstract sphere down into the physical and the material. And I do actually think, I think this is a conversation that the liminal web has even been going through. And Layman, you've been writing about this. Cadell and I have been talking about this is, okay, we've been doing all of these podcasts, but how do we build up economic structures? How do we build up lifestyles? How do we build up economic agency and political agency as opposed to literally just being ourselves reverberating ghosts of electromagnetism? Yeah, that um, there's a way of talking that comes into integral theory out of theosophy and things like that, where we classify gross, subtle, causal, and non-dual sets of states. And there's an old way of spiritual or mystical thinking, which is uh, reductive, where it thinks, oh, you start as the physical and you're trying to get to the subtle. And then if you're really good, you drop even all that magic shit and get to just the one transparent universal God. And then you'll drop even that and pass into the non-dual as if they were a, a stack of increasingly valuable abstractions. But really, I think what the new eon is looking at is something like constantly having all four of those in circulation and aligning them uh, maximally at all times. So you're trying to use them to constrain each other for the purposes of individual and mutual empowerment. One of the areas where the subtle and the astral can be constrained is, and this is an interesting terminological shift, right? We start saying imaginal instead of astral, and suddenly we're welcome into cognitive science discussions. But the imaginal is distinct from the rest of the imaginary because it's revealing functional patterns of reality. So there's this notion of a more rigorous subset of what imagination reveals. They're not all equally real in the imaginal. And then likewise, one other place that the astral can be anchored is by uh, constraining it to the gross realm. And that's in terms of what can it actually affect, but also in terms of everything we're learning now about what your physical organism has to have in order to be able to function and operate in these other spaces. If you're not getting adequate sleep, if you don't have the right amount of hydration, then you're going to be distorting your ability to see imaginal patterns. So all of these domains have to be understood to be co-constraining each other. When we enter into that kind of a discourse, not only are we healthier and more effective, but we come much closer to being an acceptable discourse to leading edge science and thought communities. Yeah, it's interesting. Like even in the in Dion Fortune's work on the Kabbalah that I've been reading. So in the Kabbalah, the tenth plane, the material plane, Malkuth, and then you'll say the imaginal, the astral plane will be Yesod, the ninth plane. But she emphasizes, and it's emphasized throughout the tradition, that basically this is a dangerous plane precisely because it can be deceptive as well as enlightening. And the way to work with it effectively is to constantly be looking up to the next sphere above it, which is the sphere of Tifareth, the sun, and kind of connected to this idea of the one the one god essentially and so there's this sense of seeing the emanations that are showing up as coming from something that is deeper and truer and more beautiful as opposed to getting lost in them for what we are and i think actually when i think about what's happening with say internet culture even just electronic culture is endless playing around with the imaginary as opposed to the imaginal without any kind of metaphysical connection to the one, whatever the one might mean. And do you see the the way point in there, the connecting point in there, what you were trying to refer to uh, with the, the political and economic dimension? Um, or, the, or the material and the bodily? I'm not quite sure what you're asking there. Just that you're saying this digital realm is very disconnected from the one? Yes, I I think there's something in it's having that stack aligned. So mm -hmm. being able to see there is an imaginal realm, there's something more abstract, more intangible than that, which you might call God, you might call the one, you might call the universe, you might even call negativity, depending on what we're playing with. And then there's something also that's more tangible and more material than that. And being able to think in terms of all three and indeed the other planes as well, simultaneously, 
and training oneself to be able to hold these different planes. I like what you said, Layman, actually, but not thinking it in terms of trying to get higher and higher and higher, but actually having the planes balancing one another. You know, there's been a reductive discussion in certain areas of traditional and classical mysticism, and it's carried through. You find it in the integral community and places like that, where the magical and also the shamanic are treated as a low grade form of spirituality that eventually anybody with any sense is going to have released their interest in the imaginal dimension and moved on to these ultra abstract transparent dimensions. And I think what's really important, and as part of healing that rupture in the world that Nietzsche is pointing to, that Reich is pointing to, that so many people have been pointing to, you have to um, replace the highest levels in the situation where you are instantiated, right? That the causal and the non-dual, so to speak, that the trans-imaginal domains are located in the body, in nature, and also in the imaginal. They're operating and interpenetrating. The universal is instantiated in the particular, which is a fundamental tantric non-dual insight that empowers all kinds of magical practice with the capacity to be aligned to the greatest and most radical spiritual and existential states, but to give those states potency in the world by keeping them all aligned and by conceiving the maturational development of the human spirit not as something that moves increasingly outward into abstract refined empty vastness but something that folds back into the instantiated particularity of the moment that this this relationship and this moment of will and this moment of desire when handled correctly is the fundamental instantiation of liberty and of the universal and of love itself but the attempt to locate those by escaping from the manifest uh, is a sign of a pathological contraction that postulates its seeking and pushes its value standard into a non-existential domain, which is problematic. Right? This is how Nietzsche saw nihilism in a lot of ways. It takes the highest value and the greatest sense of reality, and it locates it somewhere where it can't possibly be. So you can never have access to it by honoring it. Instead, you have to be able to uh, access all those states, maintain functional alignment with your experience of the phenomenology of the good itself, but locate those in yourself and in this moment and in the body and in this world and in the imaginal forms that cooperate with this world. I mean, the, the thing that's coming up for me there is sort of what you were saying about there's this idea that the and maybe this will bring the conversation full circle in a sense that the the magical and the shamanic are are can be perceived or are often perceived as low grade forms of spirituality that this is something that we're going to be progressively moving away from um what's your experience both within the integral um the integral movement and and maybe also the meta modern space uh with your current projects um do you feel like there's there's root there's room for them or is there is there resistance and suspicion um or uh, um if you haven't had a reaction yet what's uh, your anticipation I think there's a lot of um interest and openness in the integral world for the shamanic discourse and a little bit less for the specifically magical discourse I think the mm, there's a lot of openness to occult experimental practices in metamodern communities, but also a lot of inherited lingering postmodern suspicion about the development of the will and whether or not people feel entitled to pursue the creation of realities that they personally would find extremely enjoyable. long deep pause and reflection <laughs> yeah there's um i think what we don't see very well is the ideological layer of all of this 
I think there's a, like I was saying, a general problem of social dynamics trying to recapture and undermine the sacred that permeates all of these communities. And I think it permeates integral more so than metamodern, partly just because it's a more explicit community and has been more overtly oriented in spirituality. But I think there's a tendency in all of these areas to try to push out and marginalize these sorts of practices without seeming to be doing it, right? There's a, what we have to watch for in these communities specifically is a, a tendency to be the overt symbolic affirmers of the necessity to explore all of these different things and somehow to use that um, to become completely disinterested in actually either practicing or exploring or rethinking any of these domains. Yeah, I feel you. Um, or I, I mean, I can, I can see, I can see that um, as a potential trap or, or danger. Um, Owen, is there anything coming up one, for you? Let me throw one more thing in there. Like yeah. okay. we were just touching on the notion of the, uh, of the magical and the shamanic as low grade. Now I think, there has to be an availability to an ideological critique of that because what these things specifically bring to the table through the use of practice and the use of the will and through the exploration of the imaginal is an increase of the agency of the individuals or networks of individuals. And that's specifically something that any dominant ideological power structure would be reticent toward. It's much nicer for any power structure if you are interested in just mindfulness, or if you are interested in just God, or if you are interested in just an unspeakable, invisible background condition. But if you want to actually increase individuals' ability to make changes to the systems in which they are operating, that's suddenly something where you would expect there to be ideological suspicion and resistance. Owen, is there something you'd want to add to this? You're you're on mute again, Owen. This is becoming a meme. Uh, what I would add is that something I've just been thinking of today, um, theory by a, a guy called Jim Battista Vico, who had this theory of how religion moves through society. So he thought, for example, in the ancient world, you've got a lot of, say, we take Greece, primitive fertility cults ritualistic which gradually as the settled civilizations and their cities grow bigger are formalized into the official city cults with their priesthoods who then build the mysteries and at the same time you then have an intellectual elite culture growing up that is engaging with this priestly formalization of the old you might say shamanic religion and so you end up with a state where you've got the platonic academies where plato and his students were initiates in the mysteries and playing around with whatever these things meant and then as the cultures progress even further the, the high intellectual culture tends to go more and more in the direction of the abstract and cuts itself more and more from you might say the the imaginal or the imaginary folk religion until it reaches a point where the elite culture reaches a kind of dead formalism. And at the same time, the folk culture is building up elsewhere. And so I think, for example, in the decline of the Roman Empire, Empire what you see is on the one hand, these increasingly abstract Neoplatonic schools. And then at the same time, this weird Christ cult which is coming from the very fringes of the empire and has a lot of overlaps with this Dionysus cult. But then again, as time goes forwards, the Christ cult seems to blend with this platonic idea of the one, which eventually gets formalized into something like the seeds of the new religion, which is Christianity, which then takes a long time coming to fruition. Probably you might say flourishes. Its high point would be in something like the European Renaissance. And then Again, this same pattern starts to happen that the intellectual culture goes in a progressively more abstract way, initially still thinking through the symbols of the religion, which you might say is what the 19th century idealist tradition was doing, and Kant and Hegel really still investigating what is the philosophical truth of Christianity. And then you reach a 20th century, though, where the high intellectual discourse is more and more 
uninterested in, say, the religious conversation. It finds it absurd. And then at the same time, again, a return to these organic, you might say, folkish practices coming up. And we've spoken about the 60s and the 70s. And I think we're at the point today where the empire is kind of starting to collapse. And on the one hand, you've got these high academic schools of formalism. And on the other hand, you've got these very participatory embodied schools that aren't necessarily particularly philosophically mature. And where I think there's actually interesting work to be done, and I think that's actually the conversation that all of us are involved in, is synthesizing these two. I tend to see the, say, the metamodern discourse as being similar to the old Neoplatonic discourse. And I mean, even Viveki himself is into Neoplatonism. And I think the risk there is that it just continues to think itself into oblivion. And then you've got, you'd say the, I guess what I'm calling the, the folk movement. Again, the risk there is that it stays being into its embodiment rituals and its practices, which feels good but it doesn't create this relationship with what we might call the idea of the one, the platonic idea of the one. And I think where the interesting thing is, again, is the way that Cadell, what we've spoken about, the way that I think philosophy has refined the platonic idea of the one. It's changed into something like a not one. And maybe you yourself can explain this better because I think this is, this is kind of in your philosophy better than it is in my thinking. But I can kind of see that this refinement of the idea of the one that's happened through philosophy through the last 2000 years being seeded then into the emergent uh, nature cults is where the potential is for a new religiosity that's going to take several hundred years to emerge is happening. Well, there's, there's a, a a lot a lot there to unpack. I mean, I th I think that it's 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 interesting to sort of see the way in which, um, sort of your reading of of ancient uh, Christian history, ancient Neoplatonic history, uh, and all of those movements still have relevance or repetitions today. Um, I mean, I I think that it's 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 particularly interesting here to just just get sort of layman's sort of view on on where zagic or where th this practice of magic could be could be situated specifically in relationship to to things like like cognitive science or metamodernism because those are those are in some sense movements that you're you're very much aligned with and very much working with is it is it is it something where what owen's saying is is a real risk here in regards to something like metamodernism thinking itself into oblivion or something like that do you feel like that's a a real risk uh, that where Zagic might play a role in un, uh, undoing this tendency? Absolutely. Like what we're seeing now is the um, emergence driven by a lot of external and internal forces of a new cultural sensibility, right? Um, an increased ability trained through our new tools to be multifarious and self-reflective uh, combined with the uh, accumulating failures of the modern system and the clearly inadequate kinds of critiques that come out of postmodern approaches. All of that with the obvious need to try to still live and be a sincere participant in the world conspires uh, first through art and then through theory to create this new opening of some kind of post-postmodernism, metamodernism, integrally informed, whatever that is. But it will still be either potent or impotent, healthy or unhealthy, the way every kind of cultural movement has been throughout history. And in order to be healthy and potent, uh, I think Owen said it very well. I, I reference this in my own mind through uh, Nietzsche's first book, The Birth of Tragedy from the Spirit of Music, where he talks about Homer and Archilochos, where he talks about the like folk poet and then the high poet of the transcendental forms and how these reflected the two different cultural trends that informed early Greek society. And it was only where through the development of the tragic ritual these things were able to come together that you got the tremendous explosion of cultural generativity that we associate with classical Greece, right? That that energy was built up in the pre-Socratic period in a culture that was a very magically oriented culture. 
right, that was doing its rituals, that it was performing its Dionysian rites, that was going to see uh, and get information from the tranced out oracles. That was very deeply integrated, and it was part of the cultural engine that made them so world historically potent, such that we are still using and drawing upon and referencing the forms generated in classical Greece. If we want to have that same kind of robustness and ability to impact the situation that we find ourselves in, we've got to do something similar. The sort of um, a rational folk spirit has to come together with our really advanced forms of cognition and thinking. They have to be embodied. We have to empower the will, but we have to do some kind of tragedy embracing diversity and transformation work, some kind of ritual practice, whatever we end up calling it, that can allow these things to be synthesized in a way that actually generates the energy that turns this into something useful, rather than just uh, one another empty cultural fad that isn't going to address the meta crisis that we find ourselves in. All right. Well, I think on on that very important note, I mean, I guess just as a as a closing reflection, I would maybe want to get um, your perspective on on what maybe the the next steps you're intuiting are uh, uh, for for people who are interested want to get involved in in what you're what you're speaking into existence. Uh, where can they where can they find uh, reliable material or materials that will at least allow them to to dip their toes in these proverbial waters and um, maybe what to what to look out for in in 2024. Uh, well. Uh, I'm looking forward to us doing some work together. And I think some magic of that and psychoanalysis. Involved. Yes. And uh, I think a deeper discussion around the Lacanian forms and the, the specific relationship between the real symbolic and imaginary that magic suggests that might be different than the standard relationship between the symbolic real and imaginary that dominates social forms. That's a really interesting discussion. Uh, magic and psychoanalysis will be working on that. I'm going to be continuing to refine and cluster and tweak the ideas of magic in the zagic.substack blog. And we'll be looking, Scout and I, at doing another and extended course next fall with Parallax. Um, the only idea we've had so far to make it specific is to sort of extend the development of the skills and then also do some more dynamic digital ritual work. But one of the things I picked up in this discussion from you, Cadell, I think is a lot of interest around the role of the will and uh, figuring out how to strengthen the will, not get trapped in the will and figure out what to will that I'm thinking now that that fall course for Parallax really could be centered around will and thalema and intent as a fundamental uh, and diverse and complex skill set. Uh, and for me, this is an ongoing thing. Like my, um, a lot of my work is in theory. A lot of my work spiritually is in sort of Eastern Buddhist and Taoist styles. A lot of my overarching work in the last few years is around the shamanic and the meta shamanic phrasing even though I grew up with um, a lot of information and exploration of occult and magical domains, it hasn't been at the center of my articulation. And mm -hmm. so this is partly what I'm doing is starting to figure out how I want to come at saying these things and how I think uh, my own unique articulation of this could help situate this space between these other discourses and help bring magic up to the level of a world transformational wisdom discourse and help the otherwise dominant wisdom discourse to have the potency and vibrancy that comes from the magical arts. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of potential. I mean, I think that, um, I think the role I tried to facilitate in this podcast was just sort of trying to, um, find a way to 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 bring to the surface these rich distinctions that i feel like you're playing with in in magic and maybe uh create a, a very sharp boundary between what owen was talking about between sort of maybe the the caricature of magic that people might have and and some of the more richer elements that i think you're bringing out and also you know in informed by like you said um like we we brought up crowley and and the role of the will i mean for me, where I'm touching into magic or, or, um, you know, um, exploring myself is 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 in that dimension of, um, 
my trouble with willing? Where do I feel impotence? I think that's another touch tone that might be interesting to talk about at the, the nexus of magic and psychoanalysis is the will and impotence um, and also desire and, and the other's desire that like I think to me what's coming out in the Lacan course is not just this interconnection between the imaginary symbolic and the real, but desire is the other's desire. Um, and, and how does that play into magic? Uh, it might be interesting to to think on further with you in in the new year. So that's that's sort of where I am, and and I definitely think that <clears throat> the way you're really feeling into the coincidence between the universal and the particular in your course is is something that um, uh, I take as a, an inspiration and a and a model for for um, the type of philosophy that 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 interests me and 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 continues to drive my my thinking. Um Owen, what about what about you? What what's coming to your mind from this conversation? Where are you with the concept of magic and maybe what are you taking from Owen's uh what are you taking from Layman's perspective that might be uh informing your work in 2024? Well, I think even just from this conversation we've just had, I think that distinction we just came to of the imaginal versus the imaginary or we might say the higher astral and the lower astral is really helpful refinement. And I think actually that even in terms of conversations that we we have ongoing, Cadell, about I, I get a sense, maybe I'm wrong, but I think the psychoanalytic discourse has a tendency to look down on the imaginary. But I think with the framing of the imaginal, as opposed to the imaginary, that might help sift through and help clarify what I think the magical discourse is trying to say. And where it might be able to interact with psychoanalysis on a more uh, nuanced way, perhaps. Um, other than this, I mean, I, th I think the work Layman's doing is is brilliant and people should follow it, basically. Um, I mean, I, I said before, the podcast you guys did a couple of years ago on Nietzsche, I think, is one of the best podcasts ever. And it's kind of been a, a privilege to be able to do the Crowley podcast with the two of you. I, and I basically do see Crowley as the other Nietzsche. I think Crowley holds the position in the occult community that Nietzsche holds in the philosophy community. I think Zarathustra and the book of the law uh, or Zarathustra and Ivas, you might say, hold very similar positions in the kind of the poetic history of, uh, of mankind, really, you might say. And um, yeah, absolute blast to be in this, basically. Right on. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's opening a whole other can of worms to to talk about psychoanalysis and the imaginary, but certainly there's um, a rich discussion here, uh, which which we we barely even scratched the surface of the connections between um, magic and psychoanalysis. So that's that's really where I am in looking forward to 2024. There'll be a we're going to have a workshop with Layman Pascal on on magic and psychoanalysis. So if you're interested in that. Um, you can find more about that at philosophyportal.online. Um, I guess just uh, I'll, I'll leave the last word to Layman. Uh, any any last thought you want to leave the viewers with before we we sign off here? No. For courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit Philosophy Portal Online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events. In January, we focus on the concept of libido and welcome guests Layman Pascal, Alenka Zupancic, and Elliot Rosenstock. Find out more at philosophyportal.online.